Welcome to the 700 Club, and thanks for joining us. Uh, today is the first day for Ashley Key. Uh, she's going to be now a regular co-host of the 700 Club on Wednesday. So we're going to start calling these shows Ashley Wednesday. Oh, gosh, Just no. for fun, just no. in honor of Ashley. No, very and, blessed. And right? don't worry, Wendy and Dad aren't going anywhere. That's a right. week from today, they're going to be hosting this show. Later in today's program, we'll tell you how you can be involved in that show if you want to. Yep. But first, let's turn to the headlines. A former Facebook employee has called out the social media giant. She blew the whistle on its deliberate promotion of content harmful to teens and younger children. She also brought thousands of internal documents before Congress to back up her claims. The whistleblower compared Facebook's tactics to those of big tobacco, both targeting youth to get them hooked for life. She also called on Congress to take action. So how did the senators respond? Charlene Aaron has the details. In stunning testimony before a Senate subcommittee, whistleblower Frances Haugen revealed research that shows how Facebook puts profits over people and particularly harms young girls. The choices being made inside of Facebook are disastrous for our children, for our public safety, for our privacy, and for our democracy. And that is why we must demand Facebook make changes. The former Facebook product manager says the social media giant knowingly promoted addictive and divisive content through deceptive algorithms to control what they see. She claims Facebook targets teens and children as young as eight. Facebook understands that if they want to continue to grow, they have to find new users. The way they'll do that is by making sure that children establish habits before they have good self-regulation. By hooking kids. By hooking kids. Haugen released thousands of internal documents showing the company's own research revealed Facebook's Instagram has a negative impact on teen girls. One in three girls felt worse about their body image, added to feelings of anxiety and depression. The company knowingly marketed dangerous content regarding eating disorders and self-harm to kids. Donna Rice Hughes, president and CEO of Enough is Enough, highlighted the problem on CBN's Faith Nation. It's very toxic for teen girls. We know that, that in particular, tween girls, 12 to 14 years, when they're starting to go through pu puberty, they're particularly vulnerable to body shaming, to comparison, to peer pressure, to bullying. Kids younger than 13 can get onto these platforms, all of them, including Facebook. And so Facebook has known this. They have absolutely no age verification technology in place. Haugen compared Facebook to the tobacco industry, saying both target young kids who get addicted. It's absolutely true. Hook them young and keep them on for life. Dan Gaynor of the Media Research Center says parents must closely monitor their kids' online activity. You've got to, you know, periodically look at your kids' phones like, oh, you have seven new apps on the phone. What are these? Lawmakers responding to Haugen's call to regulate the social media giant. Here's my message for Mark Zuckerberg. Your time of invading our privacy, promoting toxic content, and preying on children and teens is over. Congress will be taking action. Facebook's CEO Mark Zuckerberg now responding to Haugen's claims, posting last night, quote, at the heart of these accusations is this idea that we prioritize profit over safety and well-being. That's just not true. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Well, it's been known for years that these social media giants are uh, actually using the algorithm to hook us all in. And whether it's the like button or, you know, how many followers do you have, all of these things uh, are sort of false indications of, of, of social media influence. And uh, it's, it's designed um, by psychologists uh, to hook you and to get you repeatedly looking at your phone and repeatedly engaging with that app so that they can make money off of you. You're the product. Uh, the more they can claim your eyeball is on their app, the more money they can get from advertising. Will Congress ever act here? I, I, I don't think so. I don't think there's the political will to do it. And there certainly isn't a uh, political harmony on Capitol Hill to actually get anything done. 
Uh, it would just take some uh, lobbyists ex exercising very little influence on just a few select senators, and the whole thing would not, not get through and not be passed into law. So what can you and I do? Well, we can actually start recognizing what these devices are trying to do. They're trying to distract us. They're trying to get us to engage in it. And you can set limits on what you allow yourself to do in sharing information. Realize you are the product. Uh, don't let them take advantage of you. Limit your time on the device. One of the wonderful things that um, uh, I have to applaud Apple, they're giving you a report now how much screen time. The reason they're doing that is they're trying to encourage you to reduce your screen time. So take that advice, reduce it, uh, and have a better life. Well, in other news, the Attorney General is mobilizing the Department of Justice to address threats and harassment against school boards. Uh, this is unbelievable to me. Talk about a chilling effect on free speech. Just imagine you go and make a protest at a school board meeting and now the FBI is going to start tracking you and they're going to start thinking this is some kind of domestic terrorism and that you should be put on a list and tracked. Uh, this is unbelievable and it has no place in a free and open society. John Jessup has more on that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John. Thanks, Gordon. As you were saying, this week, Attorney General Merrick Garland ordered the FBI and U.S. attorneys to meet with state and local authorities to come up with strategies to fight what he calls a disturbing trend of harassment, intimidation, and threats against school board members nationwide. The memo coming just days after the National School Boards Association sent a letter to President Biden calling for action in the wake of contentious, sometimes raucous, public meetings. The association's letter suggesting the threats are comparable to domestic terrorism as angry parents protest issues like critical race theory, COVID policies, and sexually explicit content. Tuesday, Missouri Republican Senator Josh Hawley pressed U.S. Deputy Attorney General Lisa Monaco on the limits of the new policy. And is waiting to express one's view at a school board meeting, harassment and intimidation? As the Attorney General's memorandum made quite clear, Spirited debate is welcome, is a hallmark of this country. Um, it's something we all should engage in. And no, I don't think so, Ms. Monica. With all due respect, it didn't make it quite clear. It doesn't define those terms. But harassment and intimidation, what did those terms mean in the context of a local school board meeting? If this isn't a deliberate attempt to chill parents from showing up at school board meetings for their elected school boards, I don't know what is. Senator Hawley sent a blistering letter to the attorney general charging that the memo is aimed at intimidating opponents of liberal policies. Well, turning now to the fight over President Biden's domestic agenda, no agreement yet between progressive and moderate Democrats on the parameters of his social spending bill, and that's stalling progress on a much needed measure to shore bridges, roads and other infrastructure. And now as the debt ceiling loom, uh, debt ceiling deadline rather looms larger, Democrats are considering a drastic step. CBN Capitol Hill correspondent Abigail Robertson reports. Democrats are now looking to pass both the infrastructure and social spending bills by the end of October. It's still unclear, however, whether progressive and centrist Democrats can reach a deal by then to get either bill across the finish line. This is a process. We'll get it done. The budget reconciliation price tag is the main issue holding up negotiations, with centrist Democrats wanting a $1.5 trillion cap, while progressives argue that's not nearly enough. That's too small to get our priorities in, so it's going to be somewhere, you know, between 1.5 and 3.5. Progressive House Democrats are withholding support for the Senate-passed infrastructure bill until an agreement is reached on the larger spending package, delaying a much-needed legislative win for President Biden. What we agreed on is that the price tag had to come down. What we agreed on is that we had to sit down with Senator Manchin and negotiate something. What, what some of us said is reduce the number of years uh, that these programs exist, and that will really help us get to consensus. Congressman Ro Khanna, a member of the House Progressive Caucus, told CBN News's Faith Nation he's open to including the Hyde Amendment, which forbids federal funding of abortion and is opposed by progressives, in the final bill to help secure Senator Joe Manchin's vote. As you know, the Hyde Amendment 
is the law of the land. I don't expect that reconciliation uh, will repeal it, so I think we could get to a uh, compromise there. Far left protesters are turning on the centrists, going as far as following Senator Kirsten Cinema into a bathroom and using a kayak flotilla to surround Senator Joe Manchin's houseboat. What are you going to do for the we'll poor working, in West we're Virginia? Working, we're going to be working everything we can to create good opportunities. And we need to tax the rich. Oh, I agree with that. And Democrats still face that deadline to raise the debt ceiling before October 18th, when the government runs out of money to pay its bills without Republican support. Now, the president says Democrats are considering doing away with the filibuster so they can pass it on a straight vote. Are Democrats considering using a nuclear option to raise the debt limit? Oh, I think that's a real possibility. If nothing is done by October 18th, the American people could see an unprecedented economic catastrophe. Reporting from Capitol Hill, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Thank you, Abigail. Well, turning overseas to the Philippines, where President Rodrigo Duterte has announced he's retiring from politics when his term expires next year. One potential replacement, world boxing legend Manny Pacquiao, who's stepping out of the boxing ring to enter a new arena, presidential politics. CBN's Lucille Toulousan has more in this exclusive interview. I just heard the final bell were the words of the great boxing icon Manny Pacquiao as he announced his retirement from his phenomenal boxing career. Spanning four decades, he became the only boxer to win 12 world titles in eight divisions. He thanked boxing for getting him and his family out of poverty and for inspiring many people. Pacquiao, currently a senator in the Philippines, has announced his candidacy for next year's presidential elections. What compelled you to run for the Philippine presidency? I already announced my uh, uh, retirement, uh, and I want to focus uh, to a bigger fight in life, which is uh, serving people, uh, fighting against corruption and uh, um, injustice. Part of that corruption deals with $200 million in unaccounted aid for the pandemic. Pacquiao has questioned four government agencies for alleged misuse. I saw the situation of this country is really bad. People are suffering. And what I saw is uh, hopeless. Our people deserve a better future. I always believe that God has a purpose for me. And he raised me from nothing into something for a purpose. Not only uh, giving inspiration to the people, but also uh, uh, to help them and fight for them. And what is your answer to, you know, people who tell you that uh, it is going to be a very difficult fight because you're up against um, corrupt people who are also in power? Uh, one of my favorite verses is in Isaiah 41, verse 10. It says, uh, so do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So uh, only to God we fear. We, fear, we have fear. The most important thing, we glorify God in our daily lives. Lucille Talusan, CBN News, Manila. Thanks, Lucille. Uh, Gordon, you spent years in ministry in the Philippines. You think he stands a chance? Absolutely. Uh, Manny's a friend. He's a very dedicated Christian. Uh, he's put it all on the line, obviously, in a, in a boxing ring. And uh, just imagine four decades uh, in that kind of combat. It definitely prepares you for politics in the Philippines. If you think politics is rough and tumble here in the United States, uh, the Philippines is a whole nother matter. But I admire the, the new generation of Christians coming up and saying, we need to stand against corruption. We need to stand against uh, these spiritual forces, wickedness in high places. Uh, we need to do that because righteousness exalts a nation. Uh, the, if the Philippines can turn around, it could be a shining light to all of Asia, to all of the world, as to what can happen when a nation fears the Lord. So congratulations, Manny, for throwing your hat into the ring, and you have my best wishes. Ashley? 
Awesome. Well, next Wednesday, October 13th, we'll be featuring your voicemails on this program. Pat Robertson will be back in our studio to answer those questions live on the 700 Club. And to leave a question for Pat, all you have to do is just call the number on your screen right now, 800-677-7884. The phones will only be open today from now until 5 p.m., so make sure to call. Again, the number is one 800 Eight, I'm sorry, 677-7884 and tune in on the 700 Club one week from today to hear Pat answer your questions live on air. When Dr. Sarah Gottfried and her husband followed the same diet, he lost 20 pounds and she gained weight. Well, that led to the doctor on a journey to discover why and to develop a diet specifically designed for women. Medical reporter Lori Johnson brings us the results. Men and women carry different hormones. That could be a reason why women might have a harder time shedding extra pounds than their male counterparts. Plus why it's important to have a tailor-made plan. Dr. Sarah Gottfried learned that firsthand. I was trying the ketogenic diet with my husband. He lost 20 pounds, I gained weight. And I hear that from so many of my patients and uh, followers, so I think it's really important to realize that the missing piece is hormones. Diets designed by men for men can spell disaster for women. We know that most research is done on men. It's assumed to apply to women, and yet women are not, you know, men with breasts. We've got very different hormonal uh, exposures. We've got very different uh, hormonal balance. And so the way that we eat really needs to be different. Dr. Gottfried's research on women and weight loss led her to develop a hormone balancing diet that she tried on herself and dropped 20. And this is what was missing for me when I was trying to lose that 20 pounds. You know, no amount of exercise or dieting is going to work if your hormones are out of balance. She shares her plan in the book, Women, Food, and Hormones, along with 50 recipes. This is a vegetable fettuccine Alfredo. So I'm a big fan of swaps, making sure that you've got a lot of the foods that you love the most. This is taco salad, which I'm planning to have today for lunch. I've also got this beautiful turmeric braised cinnamon chicken. That's one of my favorites. For the kids and also for adults, especially husbands, I've got this nut-crusted chicken. This is almost like fried chicken. Her Gottfried protocol starts with a detox. So detoxification includes eating cruciferous vegetables, the cabbage, the broccoli, the broccoli sprouts, the radishes, the cauliflower. The next phase involves eating mostly healthy fats. For breakfast, I've got an egg avocado bake. So that's an example of really healthy fat. While the plan is similar to the keto diet, the Gottfried protocol includes more carbohydrates because not eating enough can cause hormonal disturbances in women. It can trigger a stress response, which raises cortisol that can block belly fat from being lost. Number two, it can cause problems with serotonin, make it harder to sleep. And number three, it can raise your reverse T3, which can block thyroid function. Eating carbs can raise the hormone insulin, so to keep it and others like leptin and ghrelin balanced, the diet calls for a 14-hour overnight fast. You're doing most of it while you're sleeping. I advise that you don't eat for three hours before you go to bed. So for instance, you might finish eating at 8 p.m., and then eat again the next day at 10 a.m. There's very little sugar on this plan, and once the hormones are balanced, those cravings tend to disappear. The reason why you're so hungry, the reason why your appetite is so high, is probably your hormones. Fortunately, there are modified comfort foods. So one of my favorites, for instance, is this dark chocolate pudding. I also have a dark chocolate coffee cake that I think is delicious. I absolutely love this. And so there are certain breads, as long as they're baked in a certain way, I've got a few bread recipes in the book that really allow you to get some of that pleasure without 
ruining your metabolic health. So ladies, if you're wondering why your husband can lose weight but you can't, you might need a women's diet designed to balance hormones so you can shed those unwanted pounds. Lori Johnson, CBN News. Well, I remember a nursery rhyme from long ago about a guy named Jack Spratt, and it looks like he's back, and he's back with a book. So Dr. Sarah Gottfried's book is called Women, Food, and Hormones. You can find it wherever books are sold. And Ashley has absolutely no need for this book because she can blow away in the next <laughs> gust of wind. That is not true. This is actually very informative because uh -huh. there really is a link. I mean, as we just saw, there's a link between foods, eating certain foods. Women, eat the carbs, make sure it's good carbs. Yeah, I think it's beneficial. Okay. It's good stuff. So you're going to take it? Yeah, I might take this home with me. You're going to give it to somebody? I might give it to my mama. Well, fast cars and hard cash. Wendell loved living the lifestyle of the rich and famous. That's why he joined the family business selling drugs when he was just a teenager. And then one day, that same family sold him out. We drinking the best cocktails and smoking the best marijuana, got the freshest clothes on. We are around millionaire drug dealers. It was a natural decision for Wendell White to become a drug dealer. Growing up in poverty on the south side of Chicago, he was surrounded by dealers who'd made a fortune. Real live people that we know have a million dollars in cash money selling drugs. We want the million dollars. We, we want the, the, the Ferraris and the Bentleys and that we see the big time drug dealers um, driving. That was, that was the fuel for everybody. It was money. We, we were only doing this for money. It was also the family business. My mom, she, she wasn't on addicted to any drugs, but she sold drugs, so that means she was out of the home a lot. So she ran the streets a lot. So it was pretty much um, us raising ourselves. Which left Wendell, the second oldest of nine children, to take care of his siblings. Not only did Wendell grow up fatherless, he also lacked the love and affirmation he needed. Sometimes I just lay down and just cry myself to sleep. I just didn't want to be there, you know, so I was alone. While his mom never made the big money, his uncle did. Wendell worshipped the man, hoping to one day be just like him. I looked up to him because he had everything that, at the time, that I thought meant something. He had money, he had cars, he had all the women. So it wasn't long before Wendell joined a gang, following in his uncle's footsteps. I started selling drugs acting for myself when I was like 13 or 14 years old. We was just in it to, you know, try to escape the poverty-stricken lives that we were living. It made me feel a part of something. You know, it made, it, it felt like a family. By 17, Wendell felt like he had arrived. Man, loving it. We got the motorcycles, we got fancy cars. We live in the lifestyle of the rich and famous that we were thinking, you know, like everybody wanted to live this life. A life that also included violence, gang wars, and constant threat of going to prison. Things Wendell just took in stride. I wasn't scared of the police. I wasn't scared of the rival gangs. I wasn't scared of none of that. It was kill or be killed. And I wasn't scared to die, nor was I scared to kill anyone. Then came a devastating betrayal. What Wendell thought was a drug deal with a rival gang member turned out to be a setup. He was beaten and forced to pay $100,000 in cash and drugs before landing in the hospital for six weeks. The man who set him up was his uncle. I felt betrayed, somebody that I had looked up to all my life. And they had betrayed me. I was lost. I was lost. I just didn't understand, like, why would somebody, you know, that I love so dearly do me like that? Then when his gang wanted revenge, Wendell wouldn't give up his uncle's location, so they kicked him out. I mean, they turned their backs on me. And again, I was all alone, again. And I was just in a real, real rough place. I was broken. I was, I was really, really broken. I was hurt. Moving on with his life, Wendell forgave his uncle and for the next 10 years moved between Milwaukee and Chicago, trying to rebuild his drug business. For a while, he did well, until his suppliers decided to cut him out, leaving him broke and on his own again. Everybody that was around me had left me. I was alone again. And man, I went through a real deep depression. In 2014, at age 33, Wendell reconnected with Renisha, an ex-girlfriend. She'd been going through her own dark times and convinced him going to church might help. 
they ended up going twice. The second Sunday, Wendell says he felt God speaking directly to him. It's like God saying, like, I can help you. Like, I can help you. I can help take that pain away. I can help you. And then as I sat there and thought, I done tried everything else, but I've never tried God. So at the end of the service, he and Renisha went up front and committed their lives to Christ. And man, I, it, I felt good. Like I felt like the weight of the world had lifted off my shoulder. I said, man, if I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it right. The couple soon married and began their new life and faith journey together. Wendell admits it wasn't easy, as he sometimes sold drugs to make up what his day job paycheck didn't cover. Eventually, though, with the discipleship and prayers of his church, he learned to fully trust God in every situation. I appreciate everything that I went through. I appreciate the slip-ups and the falls. I appreciate all that because it got me to the point where I'm, the place where I'm at right now. Today, he's fully dedicated to God with a loving family, a good job, and ready to share his faith with anyone he meets. All I try to do now is I try to impact as many people as I possibly can and lead them back to Christ to let them know the same God did it for me, he'll do it for you. And once you understand who God is, man, you know, man, you got a friend in Jesus. And you do have a friend in Jesus. I love Wendell's story because I think it's something a lot of Christians go through, that, that you want to serve him, you, you want to be a Christian, you want to act the right way, but for whatever reason, you keep falling into temptation. This is an old story in Christianity. All you have to do is go back to St. Augustine. Um, here's, here's somebody that really wanted to live for Christ and his famous prayer, Lord, give me chastity, but not just yet. When you understand that God is your friend, he's not against you. He is ready, willing, and able to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness that each stumble doesn't mean you have to fall. It means that you have to come back to him and get forgiveness. If you rely on your willpower, you're not going to make it. If you think I've got to clean up first before God will pay attention to me, you're not going to make it. It's when you fully surrender to him and come humbly to him and say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Can you can you forgive me? Can you cleanse me? But more importantly, can you give me that new heart where I won't want to do that anymore? I want to follow you. I can't change myself. Could you come in and change me? Make me new again. And then if you pray that, just like Wendell, you'll look back at your stumbles and realize that was part of your journey to get to the place of full surrender, that you know your weaknesses, you know who is your strength, it's not in yourself, you'll know that he is your righteousness, it's not anything that you come up with on your own, and you'll be put on the path of victory, that you can overcome it, but you need his help to do it. If this is for you, if you were a Christian, and then for whatever reason, you walked away. If you have recurring sin in your life, and how do I get victory over it? Pray with me. This story is for you. Jesus is your friend. He is a friend of sinners. This is the title he had in the New Testament. Uh, the Pharisees critiqued him for being a friend of sinners. Uh, they rejected him because he allowed sinful people to come near him. Isn't that wonderful? He, he took all that ridicule and said, no, this is what I'm here for. I came to save the lost. I came to restore people, to be reconciled with God. So if you're not right with God for any reason, pray with me. Jesus will be your friend. He'll come to you. He'll heal you, he'll restore you, he'll change your innermost being. All you have to do is ask for it. Let's pray. Jesus, that's right, say his name. Say it out loud, Jesus. Have mercy on me, for I am a sinner. Without you, 
I can't change my heart. I can't change these compulsions. I keep going back to the very thing I know is wrong. So Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me. Cleanse me from the things that I know are wrong. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Be with me. Give me a new heart, a new spirit, a new motivation for everything that I do. And if you do this, I want to follow you all the days of my life. Hear my prayer. Make me new again, for I ask it in Jesus' name, the friend of sinners, the friend of mine. I ask it in that name. Amen. Father, for those who just prayed, I ask for a cleansing. I ask for renewal. I ask for a baptism in your love that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit to overflowing, give them righteousness, peace, and joy in you. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you prayed with me, let me know. Give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. We've got a packet for you. It's called A New Day. And we go, my father goes into detail of how to live the Christian life. How do you overcome the compulsions of the flesh? What do Christians do? How do you do all of these things? It it's, begins with that prayer. It begins with asking God to help. But then how do you walk that out? And how do you have time with him every day? How do you immerse yourself in the word of God? It's a wonderful teaching. It's called A New Day. It's available for download, so if you want us to send, us, uh, send, send, send you a link to get it, you can have it that way. We send it to you as a CD. In the packet, there's a booklet with Bible verses. I encourage you also to get a copy of the Bible. Read it every day. If you don't have one, we have one online at cbn.com. We can even send you a daily verse, daily chapter to read, so you can read through the Bible in a year. All free, no financial obligation at all. We want you to have this so that you can walk in the light. So call us, 1-800-700-7000. Ashley? Well, every spring, Ann Graham Lotz and her family used to watch the track and field teams compete at a local college. Their favorite event? the relay race. Anne wants to remind Christians that life is similar. It's one thing to be able to run the race, but we also need to be sure to pass the baton of faith along to the next generation. Well-loved author Anne Graham Lotz has teamed up with her daughter, Rachel Ruth Lotz Wright, on a book very close to their hearts. My parents and grandparents longed to ignite faith in those who came after them. But what does that look like in today's world? It's been such a blessing to write Jesus followers with my mom. Together, we look at how God can use our witness, our worship, our walk, and our work to draw others to faith. Jesus Followers offers a glimpse into the living rooms and prayer closets of the Graham and Lotz families and equips us to leave a legacy of faith. Well, Anne Graham Lotz and Rachel Ruth Lotz Wright are joining us now via Skype. And we welcome both of you guys to the 700 Club. Thanks so much for being with us today. Ashley, thank you. And congratulations on your first day as hostess of the 700 Club. That's a big deal. Thank you so much. That's such a blessing coming from you. Well, Anne, on a personal note, your son, Jonathan, was in the ICU earlier this summer with COVID. How is he doing? Give us an update. He's doing great. His spirits are wonderful. He's um, back on oxygen at night, but he's back to preaching. He preached twice last weekend, and he's the interim pastor of a little church, so he preaches every weekend. And um, and I just want to thank all those, Ashley, who uh, listen to you, people who uh, have been praying for him because God has answered prayer. Thank you for that. Amen. Amen. Well, in your new book, you compare the passing of one's faith to a relay race. How so? Give, go more into depth about that, Anne. 
Well, we pulled, I pulled out uh, the basis from Genesis chapter 5, which is a genealogy. And there were 10 men in that chapter who passed the truth to the next generation. And each generation has to embrace the truth for themselves. But it went from um, Seth, who was Adam and Eve's third son, all the way down to Noah. When it came to Noah, he was the last man um, you know, who received it, and no one else did. If, if it hadn't been for those men passing that truth down from generation to generation, we wouldn't be here, Ashley. And so um, it's very critical that every generation um, not only knows the truth, but embraces the truth and passes the truth to the next generation. So they pick it up and they embrace it for themselves. And so the theme of this book, we've just taken four parts from that Genesis 5, the, the uh, witness, the worship, the walk and the work. And then Rachel Ruth has written some incredible stories to illustrate each part. And uh, and we just want, uh, it's, it's part of our family heritage. God has given us a our incredible heritage, and we just want to invite other people who perhaps haven't had a heritage like ours, but to share in ours through the examples that Rachel Ruth writes in this book. Yeah, absolutely, and I love the stories that you guys include in it. Well, Rachel Ruth, your grandfather's crusades introduced millions of people to Jesus, but you knew him as Daddy Bill. What did you learn from him in your childhood? He, I loved him because I knew him as my grandfather. And so even though he was up on stage and, and that's how people saw him, when we were with him, he was so grandfatherly and so sweet. And I wrote a story in the book about how he gave us his full attention. So when we were in the room, it was like we were the only people in the world and he would listen to us and pray with us. And I remember my sister and I going up to spend a weekend with um, he and my grandmother and crawling up on their bed and it was snowing outside and the fire was going. We would just read the word together and pray. And he was wonderful and made such an impact on my life. He was very consistent and and also very humble. And so I remember multiple times him telling me, I just feel like I haven't done enough and almost emotional about it when he said it. And that made a huge impact on me. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Anne, how did your faith, uh, how did the parents of your faith and grandparents influence your life? You know, I think primarily, Ashley, by their example. Mm -hmm. And uh, my room was over my mother's in the house in which I grew up and at night, uh, I'd slip downstairs, she would be on her knees in prayer for, for a long, I, in fact, I would go back up to my room because I knew she wasn't going to interrupt her prayer time. I'd get up in the morning real early uh, before daylight, see the, the um, light on the trees outside my window, go downstairs, she'd be at her flat top desk reading her Bible. I would catch her in prayer, I would catch her reading her Bible, and then she lived it out. Uh, my grandparents were the same way, and, uh, and my daddy, my mother, uh, every morning led us in family devotions with Bible reading. Um, and so she taught me by her example to read my Bible every morning. And then my daddy, when he had devotions at night, he would read a passage and explain it and we would discuss it. And he taught me to think about what I was reading. So, so I think, you know, there are practical things we can do and Rachel Ruth covers those in these stories, but it's also just uh, what I guess both of us would stress is the authenticity of our own relationship with Jesus. I have to be a Jesus follower or myself um, in order to lead my children, my grandchildren, and to uh, um, really impact those around me so that they too choose to be a Jesus follower. Yes, amen to that. Well, Rachel Ruth, tell us what you admired about your grandmother, Ruth Bell Graham. You also have a really funny story about something she wore to a formal dinner one night. Tell us about that. <laughs> she was amazing. I We miss her every single day. Just so full of life, so witty, so much fun, but very, very godly. And, and she also would pray with me and we'd discuss scripture and she was such a godly um, influence in my life. But that one situation, she didn't have a formal to wear, so she wore her nightgown, <laughs> just dressed it up with pearls and made it look so nice. And so wow. she was just so, so fabulous and so for real mm -hmm. and loved Jesus with all of her heart. And it was evident on her face. It was evident everything she did. And, and I know we just strive to be like her because she was so wonderful, so. Yeah, absolutely. What a legacy you guys are living out. Well, Anne and Rachel Ruth have much more in their brand new book. It's called Jesus Followers, Real Life Lessons for Igniting Faith in the Next Generation. And it's available wherever books are sold. Anne and Rachel Ruth, thank you guys so much for being with us today. Thank, Thank you, you, Ashley. God bless you. God bless you.
Well, one week from today on October 13th, we'll be featuring your voicemails on this program. To leave a question for Pat, all you have to do is call us at 1-800-677-7884. Our phone lines will be open today only from now until 5 p.m. Pat will be here next Wednesday to answer your voicemails live on air. So once again, make sure you give us a call. The number is 1-800-677-7884. Call today only from now now until 5 p.m. Gordon? Well, Adriana and her family had to watch as 18 inches of water flooded their home, ruined the house, ruined their belongings, and to make matters worse, they had no flood insurance. There was no way they could rebuild all by themselves. Well, as it turns out, they didn't have to, thanks to people like you. After getting hit by back-to-back -back hurricanes, Lake Charles, Louisiana got a heavy rainfall that caused widespread flooding. The water just came up pretty quickly. We had to think fast. Me and my husband, we actually started putting things up higher and making sure that the little one was okay. And once we did that, there was nothing else that we could do. The water started coming in pretty quickly. As water poured into the house, there was nothing left to do but watch and pray. What gets us through is God, praying and having that faith, because without God, you don't, you don't have anything. We do not have flood insurance, but we're not in a flood zone. We did uh, manage to save some couches, but unfortunately, we did lose all the major appliances. Andrian and Alex gutted the house themselves, but didn't have the materials to rebuild. We need help. I wanted to put our pride aside and we need help. Thanks to Operation Blessing partners and volunteers, we were able to clean up debris from the yard and dry out the house so that it was clean and ready to rebuild. Then we gave Andrian and her family new drywall and replaced all of the appliances they lost in the flood. Operation Blessing is a breath of fresh air. They're just angels. They're here to help. They're here to relieve you of some of the stress that my family's going through. It's like a weight lifted off of our shoulders. I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. We are forever grateful for Operation Blessing. And that thank you goes to you. If you're a member of the 700 Club, you're the hero of the story. Because of you, we were able to help we were able to be there for that wonderful family in their time of need. Imagine if you had gone through two hurricanes and you had no flood insurance, and where do you go, what do you do? Well, the Bible says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So if you were in that situation, you would want somebody to come alongside and help you. And that's exactly what happened. You were there for them. You can be a part of helping people here in America with disaster relief, we're putting food on the tables for families who have a lot more month and money. We're helping people around the world. And here's the best part. You are preaching the gospel around the world. A portion of every gift to the 700 Club goes into the work of Operation Blessing. Another portion goes into the work of CBN International to train Christians how to do Christian television in their own language for their own cult culture. You're a part of all of that. If you're not a member, I encourage you to join with us. All you have to do is pick up the phone and call 1-800-700-7000. If you are a member, I encourage you to increase. Uh, we have 700 Club Gold for you at $40 a month. We also have 1,000 Club. That's $1,000 a year. That breaks out to $84 a month. At whatever level, when you call and pledge, I've got something for you. It's called the Nearness of Heaven. Wonderful teaching with me and Ashley where we talk about heaven. We show you stories of people who've died and gone to heaven. But then more importantly, what are the teachings about Jesus, about the nearness of heaven, that the kingdom of heaven is, at, is nigh. The kingdom of heaven is within you. You can pray for the will of God to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, this is yours. I want you to have it. All you have to do is call us. 1-800-700-7000 and say, I want to join. I want to be a part of the 700 Club. Ashley? 
Well, I'm excited to tell you about a new project Gordon and I have been working on. It's our brand new podcast called The Lesson. And every week, Gordon and I take a deep dive into certain spiritual topics and truths, and we share scriptures and testimonies that will help you experience God on a new level. One of our subscribers on YouTube says The Lesson has become part of his weekly Bible study, which is amazing. You can watch The Lesson at cbn.com slash The Lesson, or find it on CBN's YouTube channel, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast provider. Okay. All right. So I think we have some time yeah, for some email questions. Why don't we ask a question number two? That will be short. Number two. All right. So this is from Lori. She's asking, are we all going to be about 30 when we go to heaven? I know I'll recognize my parents, but will we, will we be able to be the same age? Lori, I absolutely have no idea. Uh, <laughs> I'm hoping I'll be 30 because I'll be a lot thinner than I am right now which would be really, really good. And I won't have to go through those wretched diets. Um, you know, what, what will our glorified bodies be like? Um, there's some clues uh, from um, the resurrected body of Jesus where the crucifixion scars are still there. Um, you know, the, 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 the glory of that. Uh, at the same time, very unusual. He can eat, he can cook fish by the shores of Galilee but he can also walk through walls. What does that mean? I don't know, uh, but I look forward to it. Eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, hasn't even entered into your heart what God has prepared for those who love him. Here's a word from 1 John. For every child of God defeats this evil world, and we achieve this victory through our faith. God bless, we'll see you tomorrow.